Welcome to the Lexington Public Library's Tales from the Kentucky Room podcast, where we discuss everything Lexington and Fayette County history. I'm Miriam, and in each episode of this podcast, we will feature a guest that will share a piece of local history. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy. Welcome to the Tales from the Kentucky Room podcast, where we share stories of Lexington, Kentucky's history and people. I'm your host, David Bryant, a librarian at Lexington Public Library. Today, I'm talking to poet Willie Carver Jr., whose new book, Gay Poems for Red States, has just been released by the University Press of Kentucky. I thought it would be interesting to hear just a little bit more about you, like where you're from, um, where you grew up, how you got interested in poetry. Yeah, one, thank you for having me. I, from Floyd County, Kentucky, so eastern co-fields of the state, um, went to Martin Elementary School, Allen Central High School. And I'm trying to think of how poetry, first off, school. I just love school from the get go. I, uh-huh. It felt like magic. I remember walking in and I could see the teacher giving us something we didn't have before we got there. And I was, I remember walking out thinking every day we go in and we don't know the letter B and then we leave and we know the letter B. And it felt like she was casting spells. Like, how are you making us? And it was so powerful. And then as that kind of grew, I realized exactly what school was, which is, you know, it's quantum. These, these teachers are looking at something and imagining something else. They're seeing sort of beyond us all of these possibilities and they're simultaneously preparing for all of them. So, you know, my fourth grade teacher wasn't just teaching me about, I don't know, Kenya. She was imagining a lawyer, a teacher, um, a doctor, all these things that I could be and making sure that I had it. So I was in love with school from the earliest moments of being there. And poetry, I had a moment and I'm having one of those senior moments where I can't remember. But I was in sophomore English with Sandy Warrens, and I had finished a, a I don't know, some sort of short assignment. And I was like, what do you want me to do? And I can tell you as a teacher now, there's nothing that teachers hate worse than that. <laughs> just, like, <laughs> just entertain yourself, please. But she handed me a, a giant volume of poems um, and said, here, just entertain yourself and or it was one of those big volumes of English so I get to this big painting um it's a starry night okay and I'm looking at it and there's a little poem called this is how I want to die and it's an interpretation of that painting and I read it and it it transformed me um this this image she had of this like great beast and she saw the hair as or the cypress tree as a drowned woman and i remember just like wanting to back into this Uh, and i remember feeling like there's something below words um that that you can feel and you can't articulate and you can't articulate specifically because poetry controls your words as you're reading and that's when i got really excited by it this thought that you could paint with the tips of icebergs but know that there's something much bigger happening below. Wow. That's, that's fantastic. And it really sounds like you passed along that love of learning and discovery to your students as well. The title of your book has a decidedly political angle to it. Can you talk a little bit about that and you know how the title relates to the collection of poems? Sure. So funny thing, it wasn't the original title. Um, the original title was the epitaph, which is the truth will stand when the world's on fire. And I should have, I wasn't thinking the way, you know, a press will think, but I had a little asterisk and a little sub note that said gay poems for red states. Although I think it was gay poems for red counties. And then they presented it back to me with this new title, gay poems for red states. And at first I was like, Oh no, that's, that's not the, and they were like, trust us. This is your title. (laughs) And they were so right. They were absolutely right. But you know, I think the word for, for me, is the part that I've had to really think about the most. It is obvious that red states, in in many ways of looking at it, are against LGBTQ people. The politics are against LGBTQ people. Um, and you're probably more likely to run across a human being who is against LGBTQ people. But in a room of 10 people in Los Angeles, you're going to find four people who are against LGBTQ people. And in a room in hazard Kentucky, you're going to find six. So we're talking about two people in a room of 10. It's not that big a difference, but the, the, the effect 
of the hegemony, the effect of placating that extra two people is big and how we see things because we assume that everyone is. It's sort of the blanket assumption when you meet someone, if you're not from a red state, that this is how they feel. Um, so I really wanted to challenge that. Um, and I also wanted to speak directly to people in red states. I, it's not that I don't want someone from Vermont <laughs> or California to pick this up because I think they're going to learn a lot too. But I wanted to, to center the conversation around the people who are here. Um, so it's for them. And it's a love story. It's a, it's a love poem to Appalachia. Okay. And that's a, that's a good segue to my next question. If you don't mind, um, would you mind reading one of your poems? This particular poem I'm interested in is, is called First Crush. Yeah. Um, thank you. And thank you for giving me a name to read. It, when, it, anytime I have to choose, my bl- mind just blanks. And I can't <laughs> okay. do anything with it. First Crush. So we moved around a lot from first grade to third grade. And uh, Floyd County fights really hard to have a lot of different schools. There are a lot of small communities throughout. And so I think there are probably even still five or six school high schools. So I was at this particular school for a very small amount of time. Um, So this is just a, a memory that was very strong from it. First crush. The thing I liked most about Brandon was that he didn't just wear a shirt and he didn't just wear a sweater. He wore both. His enthusiastic colors proudly grew out from under his sweaters like cotton walls of radiating emotion. Yellow through blue, green through brown, white through red. Brandon was the first art I saw that was able to teach me just by looking that when the right things were meant to be together, beauty was inevitable. We were both in the fast reader group. Miss Colliver called us the Bluebird Group, but even first graders knew what it meant. We got to choose who read next after we finished our sentence and out loud group reading. And once Brandon chose my name, I immediately fell into a pastel dream in which we would sail to seagull adorned beaches and build sandcastles to live in and have enough money to buy me shirts and sweaters too, even though I knew he would lend me his. Brandon's toast-colored hair was always trimmed neatly, and his shoes, though white like mine, were wider, like the blank page of a coloring book that I wanted to color in all by myself. One day, my brother, sister, and me had to change schools because we didn't have electricity in the trailer we lived in. We never went back. I still think about Mrs. Colliver's class that I had to leave. I don't remember where I sat in class, or the number of kids who sat with me. I don't remember what we were reading in class, but I do remember the day Brandon chose me to read it. And on that day, in that moment, my shoes were as bright as his. Thank you. Thank you. That was so wonderful to hear you read the poem. And so you actually may have answered this already, but does that poem reflect your experience of a first crush? Absolutely, 100%. Kevin Norris was talking to me the other day and he said, you know, something about this book. He said, there's, there are poems that are so optimistic and even sweet. And he said, I, he said, I can feel the truth of them, but it conflicts with my experience of reality uh, to some extent. And he said, were you intentionally going for optimism? And I really thought about it. And what I know is when I was, when I was writing this, I had just gone through a horrific experience of homophobia involving school. And I had actually sat down to write my superintendent an angry letter, an angry email. And I wrote my first poem instead. And I realized that there was this kid in me who was silent for a long time so that I could exist. And he really wanted to speak. And so I worked hard to just let him. There were times when he would write lines. And in fact, the last lines of that poem, I actually were the the specific ones when I remember this moment. I went to erase a line because I said, this is so big and sentimental. And I could feel him standing between me and the backspace key saying, don't erase me. Mm -hmm. Everyone erased me. Wow. So I wouldn't do it. I said, I'm going to let these be what they are. But it absolutely is. You know, we... The, the issue when we, when we talk about LGBTQ youth, the problem is that 
there are so many people whose only experience with LGBTQ people is to see us through a sexualized lens. Mm -hmm. They haven't really gotten past that. They don't really see our full humanity. They see just sex. And that's a problem because I'm not just that. They're not just that. I don't see straightness as just that, right? I see straightness in all of its complications. I see people shopping. I see stressed out mothers. I see fathers who are trying to hold you know, their jobs together. I see all of these things that I know are part and parcel with their experience. And this is all they can see of mine. And so obviously when I was a kid, I had a little crush and I, I specifically would pretend that Brandon was going to come to our house and would set out plates. And I was so, <laughs> in, I remember being so involved in these little imagination fantasies that my mom was like, wait, is somebody really coming to the house? And I was like, no mom, I'm playing <laughs> because I had set out a feast for us of empty plates. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> there are also some other humorous moments in your in your poems as well. Another poem I really enjoyed was Biscuit Girl. And so again, is there is that biographical? At one hundred percent. Okay. Uh, I was working at McDonald's. Uh, the woman who was the Biscuit Girl was named Rachel. Hi, Rachel, if you're out there somewhere. <laughs> And, you know, I'm sure things have changed a lot in the last 20 years, but they McDonald's had strict rules, whether they were written down or not. They even had rules for who could work, which women were allowed to work up front. They had to be wearing makeup, for example, in the morning shift because the morning shift manager wouldn't let them otherwise. I had a colleague who had lost some of her front teeth after some illness, and they literally wouldn't let her and she cried the day that she got her teeth and they let her work front line the cruelty mm -hmm. with which we sort of treat human beings because of our expectations for who or what should be in a certain case and this was just one more example i just wanted to take over those biscuits because i spent every saturday and sunday of my childhood making them uh-huh and knew that i could do it well and i could it was a great poem so you mentioned family members and the poems and have they talked to you about being portrayed in the poems? Like how did, you know, have they reacted or how do they feel about it? Yes. Not everybody. In fact, I don't know how many of them have read them at this point or haven't there. Lord, how to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of my family members are, they just wait for stuff to happen. So the, you know, the planning of like, let's go order a book and get a book and uh -huh. read a book. I, I know they want to, and I know uh -huh. that they're, they'll be kind about it, but it, that just hasn't become a part of their lives yet. Uh, my mom has, and it's interesting. I was, I actually had my, my book debut, a wonderful group called campaign for our shared future offered to do a book launch okay. uh, for me in Manhattan. So it was just extravagant event wow. and beyond anything I ever could have asked for. And I was, I'm extremely grateful. And someone was there from the village voice who had read my book, which again, well, what is happening? And one of the things she said is your mother is sort of an angel who is persistent in this book, uh, which is exactly how I sense her. And my mom actually has expressed on multiple occasions that these this that she's glad the book exists and she thinks it's beautiful but she she feels like she's failed and i try to see what it must feel like from her perspective and i think from mine i know no one knew what we were doing in the 90s mm -hmm. you know and did she do everything that a parent of a queer child would know to do in 2023? Of course she didn't. No one did. And we didn't know how to. And so I've had to remind her, you know, this, this kid who wrote this book is writing it from 1995. He's writing it from 1994. Um, and he, he didn't have all of the nuanced social implications and awareness that he has now. He just knew that his mom could do magic. He just knew that she cared about him and that she got him the toy even when people didn't want her to. That's what he remembers. Mm -hmm. But it has, it's at least opened my mind to think about how, how time works, what it means for any of us to, to say that we're progressive uh, or to say that we're on the right side. 
I now sort of think about how we're all making mistakes. Like right now, um, we, we are making mistakes and harming people. We have no idea that we're doing it. So I try to be really aware of that. Absolutely, yeah. I am harming people right now and don't know it. And so when I, when I get the first intimations of that, when the, when the first person even hints at some harm happening, I really focus and think, okay, what am I seeing now? What is, what is starting to arrive? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's so true. What you say about the nineties versus now, because it just shows you how far things have come. Actually. Mm-hmm. I mean, now you, if you go to a pride festival, you'll see children like parents bringing their children there. And, but also these things, these issues still mm-hmm. <laughs> come up. You were the 2022 teacher of the year in Kentucky. That's a great honor. You know, you've since left high school teaching. I wonder how did you instill a love of poetry in your students? The funny thing is when I tried really hard to follow all the rules and find uh, the, you know, the, the best poems possible. Sometimes it was like drilling teeth. And it was actually because of issues that we're facing as a, a society that I ended up having my students love poems and poetry. The school was banning pretty consistently anything we tried to read from an African-American perspective anytime books had black or brown or LGBTQ characters or lessons did immediately there would be some confrontation and lots of ugliness about it. And so I really started thinking about it from a legal lens and I thought, whose voice can they not ban? And I thought my students, they are the most powerful people in this room because they have rights. And so I thought they're going to write the poetry. So what I did there are two things. One, you're asking vulnerability of young people. So I would share the most vulnerable poems I could write with them so that I could say, look, I'm doing this with you. I'm going to sit right here while we're writing. And I would invite them to write poems. And I would get really simple but poignant pieces to share. And then invite them to share. And then they would workshop in small groups and then edit. And then eventually we actually published a class magazine full of everyone's poems. And then that, that was our reading material. So we would read someone's class. Some They had the option of publishing anonymously or not. And then we would read them in class and talk about how they were communicating who they were on the inside to other people. And I saw how powerful that was. Um, definitely. By letting them speak, which we don't do enough. Yeah, absolutely. And like I said, there's been recent legislation concerning portrayal of LGBT themes and authors. I read an opinion piece that you wrote for the Courier Journal about this subject. And you know, to a certain extent, schools have always made decisions about content that is selective for students. But how is it different now? So, you know, some good examples. When I first started teaching, um, if anything was remotely sexual, for example, of any sort, uh, there would be pushback or if there, I don't know, there was a curse word. The biggest shifts have been probably since around the year 2016, any mention of race. And I'm, this is not in every school, obviously, but I, I can tell you it's in a lot of rural schools. Any mention of race is taken away. It's fine for a character to be black as long as they never discuss being black or talk about being black. Basically, as long as they appear white, um, then they can be black. The same is not true for an LGBTQ character. They're banned entirely. They will, you you can twist and turn and ban anything you want. Um, and everyone knows this. You can ban Harry Potter and say he was defiant to authority. You can ban, I mean, give me a book and I can, right. Charlotte's <laughs> Web, they were sneaking around, you know, or there's death. You could ban any book you want. And any book that has an LGBTQ character is immediately banned. In my experience, every book with a black or brown character was banned. And it is... Teachers now are faced with being a part of a system that is harming kids when their life's purpose is to help kids or leaving the system. You know, and, and the sort of the in-between is staying in a system and fighting, but it's a lot to ask someone to spend their entire life fighting every day. But I know teachers who are doing it and trying their best to to keep things afloat and to make sure that students feel seen, validated, a part of something. I think what a lot of people don't understand, because I know that there are going to be people out there who go, I get that this is unfair, but is it the end of the world? But to say to, I remember spending from kindergarten to 12th grade in school and knowing I can never say the word gay. Like Who I am is not really welcome here. I have to pretend to be something else. And I imagine being a black or brown student at Montgomery County Schools, for example, and thinking, 
I can never be referenced. You know, I'm, we're not going to read a book about someone like me. I'm not really welcomed here. Like that, that has to do so much damage. And then the numbers show that all, all the data that's, that's come out in the last five or 10 years shows that students are unhappier than they've ever been. Our rates of suicidality are higher than they've ever been. And when you break the data down, the most well-adjusted students in terms of depression and suicidality are straight students, white students, male students. And when you look at LGBTQ students of color, those numbers are phenomenally high. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those are the students who are most invisibilized. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for providing that clarity because I think sometimes people, they're like, they don't see, you know, actually what's going on. Yeah, and when you, that's kind of the point, right? When you invisibilize a problem, it makes it hard to see. And I think I think people are good. I think people just don't understand the severity of what's happening. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Is there anything else you'd like to say about your, you know, your poetry or anything that we didn't cover? Or mostly, thank you for for letting me share some of it this morning. I will say what I tried to do that I'm most proud of here is, you know, I have 156 first cousins. That is no exaggeration. Counted them in 2002. So there might be more now. I don't know. (laughs) Um, But each of my, each of my parents had one had 12, one had 13 siblings. Uh, You know, everyone has three to five kids. So I was the first to go to college. And as hard as it was to be an LGBTQ person, at least I could turn on television and see some positive examples. I knew that there were places out there, especially you know by high school, where I would be accepted. But I never saw an Appalachian person presented with dignity, ever. And there's a reason I was one out of 156 who made it to college, because college didn't really want us. College did what it what high school did to me as an LGBTQ person. It said, well, you can be here if you erase everything about your history, everything about your heritage, everything about your culture, if you become someone else. And so I had to do a lot of pretending to make it. So when I wrote this, I said to myself, not that Appalachians haven't been doing beautiful poetry because obviously they're wonderful Appalachian poets, but I thought, what if Appalachia existed entirely separately from the rest of the world and we had invented poetry? What would ours look like? And so I tried to really borrow from the beauty I had seen in language, which is not, you know, tight, tight flashes of language that have been, you know, cleaned over. I wanted surplus of words. I wanted sentences that started one place and went somewhere else. I wanted wavy sentences. I wanted, I really wanted to just honor the beauty that I had grown up with. So I hope anyone reading it can sense just some of that beauty that I was fortunate enough to have. Uh, well, you clearly have a love of, of words and language, and it really comes through in, in the poems. So, Willie Carver, thank you so much for talking to us today. It's thank you been, so much it's for inviting been wonderful. me. It's been wonderful for me, too. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to Tales from the Kentucky Room, a podcast brought to you by the Central Library's Kentucky Room staff at the Lexington Public Library. If you enjoyed listening, please take a minute to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. If you have any questions about local history or genealogy research, you can visit us in the Kentucky Room to use our collection and newspaper microfilm, or you can email us at elibrarian at lexpublib.org. That's elibrarian at l-e-x-p-u-b-l-i-b dot org. I'm Miriam, and we'll be back with another trip down Lexington's memory lane.